We have already learned that our eating behavior is the combination of what we eat, how much we eat, when we eat, where we eat, and why we eat. Let's now focus on the first question. What do we eat? What drives our food preferences and our food choices? Again, the answer is biopsychosocial. That is, it involves both biological, psychological, and social factors. Our food preferences are strongly influenced by innate biological factors. For example, we prefer sweet and salty tastes to bitter and sour tastes. Because bitter and sour may indicate poisonous or spoiled food, while the sweet taste indicates a source of safe and immediate energy. We prefer energy-dense foods, such as those rich in sugar and fat, because of our innate tendency to accumulate energy in anticipation of future times of deprivation. Every food technologist knows that the first trick to develop a product that sells is getting the right combination of sugar, fat, and salt. Not very healthy, but tastes very good. And yet, even more strongly, our food preferences are influenced by cultural factors. For example, we all tend to prefer foods that are familiar and we have known since childhood. If we are hungry, but we are presented with a food we are not very familiar with, even if we are told it's the most healthful and nutritious food in the world, our first reaction is diffidence. We look at it, smell it, see how it looks on the plate, touch it with the tip of the fork to explore its texture, while thinking, hmm, this is not really my thing, and then taste a little bit of it, wondering if it will make us sick. On the contrary, if we come across our favorite double chocolate donut, we are likely to eat it, even if we are not hungry. But our food preferences are not the only determinant of our food choices. The most important one is food availability. For us to be able to eat it, it has to be there in the first place. If I have to have lunch at school cafeteria and there is no salad bar, I cannot have a salad, even if I'd like to. If I live far from a big grocery store and I don't have a car, my access to fresh fruits and vegetables may be very limited. By food availability, we also mean the frequency of eating opportunities over the day. How many times do I have the chance of getting some food? For most of us, the answer is many more times than it would be necessary. And then what is the quality of that food? Am I surrounded by junk or healthful food? Another key factor determining our food choices is convenience. Is it ready? or does it require complicated preparation? If I have a buffet of mixed, pre-chopped, healthy vegetables, I'll be more likely to eat them than if I have to prepare them myself. The opposite of convenience is called friction. By friction, we mean all the steps, the processes, the hassle between when we decide we want something and when we actually get it. Microwaving a frozen dinner presents very little friction and very high convenience. Making sushi from scratch has a much higher friction. I have to go buy the fresh fish, prepare it, cook the rice, make my sushi, clean up everything, and quickly get rid of the trash before the house smells bad. But preparation is not the only convenience requisite. How easy is it to get it? Getting fast food or canned food may be easier than getting fresh fruit or fish. Maybe I have to drive a longer distance. We are so lazy that a group of researchers documented that at a salad bar, most people tend to get the food items that are closer to them compared to what's in the back. And they get less of it if the serving utensil makes it harder to get it. How easy is it to carry or store it? Canned food can stay there even if I don't eat it immediately, but milk or veggies will go bad soon. And last but not least, how easy is it to eat it? Eating a slice of pizza is much easier than eating a lobster. Children often don't like fruit and veggies because it takes a lot of chewing and it's a lot of volume so they just get tired of it. You'd be surprised at how much effort the food industry and restaurant chains put to make sure the food they offer you is easy to chew and swallow. So you can eat it fast and with no effort. A boneless chicken wing pumped with a solution of water, hydrolyzed protein, sodium, and phosphates, and deep-fried in a highly fat-absorbing batter and breading, just melts in your mouth way faster than a regular chicken wing. Moving on with our determinants of food choices, we find cost. Are healthful choices more expensive? 
Unfortunately, the answer is usually yes. Two nutrition experts, Adam Drovnowski and Essie Spector, once went grocery shopping asking themselves how many calories can we buy with a dollar. They found out that they could buy 1200 calories worth of potato chips or just 250 calories worth of fresh carrots. An unhealthy diet is often cheaper than a healthy one. Unfortunately, our cultural emphasis of getting the most convenience and the best value for our money has led us to a disproportionate consumption of empty carbs, and in particular everything made with white flours or potatoes. White bread, white pasta, cookies and muffins and donuts and pizza, french fries, potato chips and so on, often in supersized portions since bigger is cheaper. These are indeed cheap calories, but mostly empty. A last factor I want to discuss is our perceived nutritional value of food. This is also a determinant of our food choices, although it's often overrun by the factors we considered before. But from a nutritional point of view, this is the key motivator because it interprets our desire to eat food that nourishes us and promotes health. Unfortunately, as it turns out, most of the times the perceived nutritional value of food does not coincide with its actual nutritional value. And this is because of insufficient nutritional education combined with misleading messages coming from the media or misleading claims from the food industry. We tend to overestimate many risks, such as food additives or GMOs, as well as overestimate many benefits, such as those of eating organic or local food. We have long held false beliefs that were banged in our heads since we were little, such as the idea that fat is bad or that drinking a lot of milk is good for our bones. We worry about the effects of migrations from packaging, the potential toxicity of artificial sweeteners and the use of pesticides in agriculture, but at the same time we tend to underestimate the most important factor of all, which is very simply our choice of foods from all the different groups, how much we eat of them and in what proportions. So to summarize, our food choices are driven by food availability, by our food preferences which are in turn determined both by innate biological factors and by cultural factors, by convenient, by cost and by the perceived nutritional value of food.